Hey, I want you to go ahead and grab your Bible and turn to 1 Timothy. That's where we are. We're in a series of messages that you just saw called Paradox. While you're looking for that, we're going to read it together here in a moment. Um, I want to welcome everybody who's joining us from the sanctuary across our campus. I've got a message for the entire church family today. And all of you online, uh, again, we welcome you. We hope you'll stay in. This is a key message for our entire church family. You'll see why here in a moment. Have you ever looked at a passage of Scripture, maybe a verse, and you read it and you go, what? Like a passage that, like, what is going on here? We've got one today, okay? Multiple verses that are really difficult to grasp, um, and we're going to dive deep into it. Now, before I get there, I'm going to challenge our dads along the way, um, and I want to do this, uh, kind of my, my, I got a two-word message for all of our dads, and I'll get there in a moment. I know we got a lot of dads here who, uh, uh, former um, athletes, some of you still think, you're athletes, you know, you're, you're, you're still living the dream, uh, you're a weekend warrior, but we have, we have dads who've, you know, played college football and, you know, even professional sports and those kinds of things. So um, I, I, I was not the great athlete. Basketball and soccer was, was my sport, but a lot of you don't know that, um, I've shared this before, I'm actually a pretty outstanding bowler. I know that's kind of random, but, um, and I don't mind telling you, I don't want to brag, but I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm a great bowler. I mean, I'm an amazing bowler. Um, many of you know that bowling from the foul line to the head pin is 60 feet. Now, that's a long way for that kind of accuracy. So I bowl from six feet. Um, because, and here's why. Are you kidding me? 60 feet? I'm horrible from 60 feet. Six feet, I am deadly. Okay? Like, I've had many, many times just perfect game, 300. I'm amazing at 60 feet. Here's why. Watch this. Error increases with distance. That's why. Error increases with distance. My challenge for dads, two-word sermon every Father's Day that lands here somehow, somewhere, and I'm giving you to up front here, be there. Be there. And I know that's challenging as a father. But God has called us to be present, to stay in, to be there. And this is also an important uh, principle in Scripture, You've got to come in close. You've got, you, we're a long way from Ephesus, where Timothy is challenged to, to lead these people with all kinds of false teaching going on. We're a long way from the first century. We're a long way from where Paul is writing these words to first, in 1 first Timothy. So today we're going to get in close, okay? We're going, to, we're going to come in close, and we're going to get into God's word and say, Lord, what are you saying to us that would apply to our our culture today, okay, to our context. So the passage is out of First Timothy chapter 2. And what I'm going to do, now that you're all comfy, I'm going to ask us all, as we've done throughout the summer, I want you to stand right where you are in honor of God's word. This is his holy word for us today. I may say a lot of things. I'm praying, Lord, let me say what you would alone want me to say, not say anything you don't want me to say. But this is his word for us today. And, and let me just ask you, first reading, simple reading, literal reading of the text, if you don't come across a couple of verses here, what? Okay, verse 8, we left off last week. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Okay, that was last week. We said, let's let men lead out in prayer. How's that going for us, men? Men are to lead out in the church in prayer. He's talking about the gathering, by the way, here, specifically, the gathering like us today. Likewise, okay, so men, I got that. Now, likewise, also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel. All right, don't, don't look around too much here. With modesty and self-control, not with braided hair, oh, snap, and gold or pearls or costly attire. Anybody? Any women here ever worn gold? Any got gold on now? Brett? Okay. Repent is what I'm talking about. I'm joking. Sort of. Okay. Uh, verse 10. But with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Shh. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing 
if they, women, continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. This is the word of God for us today. You may be seated. Now, your first response, again, um, is probably, what? Right? And good luck, pastor, with this passage. Um, (laughs) We're going to dive in deep. It's one of the most challenging passages in the New Testament. It it really is. And, And it's been misinterpreted, misappropriated, misapplied. And it's caused great division in the church and great pain among our girls and our women. There's been a misguided uh, patriarchy that has pulled verses like this out of context and have caused great oppression of women in the church. Now, that's the first thing that comes out is like, what in the world? Another thing is that this is Father's Day and we're talking about women, right? Um, That's... By design. I mean, it's where we are. We decided, let's do this. Now, another thing you might notice, um, you have a man talking about this. Now, we thought we could have a woman come and speak on this, um, but I thought, this is a passage I need to preach, the senior pastor, to the entire church family. We've been in 1 Timothy. This is where we land. Let's say, let's go. Let's stay here. I've preached the content of this message to our ministry team this week. I've been the past two weeks taking a deep dive into this, but this has been a process for me for decades, I wrote, a, I wrote a doctoral paper, chose to write a doctoral paper in a doctoral seminar on the Pauline uh, letters, epistles, and his key verses around women in the church. So this has been something I've been uh, deep into for years. And as a pastor, uh, I've watched and learned a lot along the way. I've talked to women this, uh, this past week. I've sought counsel and direction. And even how, how, how does this feel to be in the church? I've been in conversation with women for many years through as a pastor. And I know that here today, many women are here today and you've been hurt by the church. Some of you don't feel that at all. You don't, you're like, well, I don't know why this is such a big deal. But for some of you, you've been hurt by the church and a sense of oppression that's come upon you, maybe in your faith family of origin, maybe in your own family of origin. And I have talked to women after I preached this sermon earlier today. I talked to women this week in in this context talking about this in tears. About what the church, not Jesus, what some in the church have done. There's been this misguided patriarchy that has done great damage in our churches. And so today I'm just praying that we come to this um, humbly. And it's a hard passage. Uh, I'm not going to share the final word on it. But I'm going to share a word for us here locally, right here. You watch me online. Many of you will be guided to this sermon at some point. Maybe you're watching somewhere in the United States or around the world. This is a message for our church family. This is a message for, I'm, I'm a local, I'm a pastor of a local church. That's what I do. I'm the pastor of this particular church. And I'm going to do a couple of things here. Um, the first thing, we're going to take a while to get to the text because I want to set this up. We're going to, we're going to place this in context okay, of the, of the redemptive arc of history, uh, of, of what God has been doing, the, the, the grander narrative of redemptive history and, and where this passage falls in all of that. We're going to get real close, as I've said, to Ephesus. We're going to go in deep. We're going to look deeply into the context. I'm going to teach you during the, in this sermon. I'm going to do something we do every week, all of our preachers and teachers do, those who are trained to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to exegete the passage. Maybe you've heard that. Uh, word before in the context of hermeneutics okay it's it's a deep dive into the text to look at the context to look at the language nuances of the original language and to talk about how scripture interprets scripture and watch this how we interpret scripture through the lens of the way of jesus all of scripture points to jesus he is the end of it all he is perfect theology so one of the things we miss often is we how many people you know This is the word of God, my authority. This is the Bible, it's what it says. That's kind of what they do with it. And they don't live much like Jesus at all. Paul says, as we saw in the first chapter, I don't care if your doctrine's right, that's bad theology. Bad theology. May it not be the case here. And as we look at this, I want to do so to, to really dive in for us as a church family to create hundreds of conversations as it guides us Um, in the days ahead. This is a topic we're going to continue to talk about. We're looking at a speaker series in the fall and one of them to be uh, on this particular topic today, women really in the church. And again, let me remind you who's talking to you. I'm the pastor of a local church. I I mean, I'm a a husband. 
I, I am a father of three children, two girls, twin daughters, and my son, who all three, each one is a spiritual force to be reckoned with. And I praise God for my son, for my daughters who are seeking the Lord. So I come at this as a father and a father of girls. Um, This is not a message to prescribe something for every church on the planet. This is not the final word, you know, that that we need to bring to the big capital C church. This is a springboard for conversation. And I also want to remind you that some of you don't know, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, um, Southern Baptist Convention church. My grandfather was the president of the Southern Baptist Convention even before I was born. Um, I was ordained in the Southern Baptist church. Uh, I, I, I went to seminary. So I say all of this because my, my upbringing, right? My, all of us, your upbringing plays into uh, the, the way we approach the Bible. And I would say this too. I too, like Timothy, who Paul says was discipled by two women, I too was discipled by women and men. In fact, I thought about this week. My youth minister, when I was in high school, was a woman, Mary Glover was my youth minister. That was normal for me. I don't know if that's normal for you growing up in the church. That, and and I, I was like, that's, that's kind of weird when I think about it. That, but it shouldn't be weird. She, she taught me the word of God. She was amazing. And I thought she was like 50. I mean, I thought she was probably 80 years old. But she was probably like 50, 60 years old. And she was incredible. And impacted my life during those most formative years. So, so I, I come at this. And, and if you're like me or older than me, like I'm, I'm in my 50s, okay? If you're in your 80s, it just simply means you've got more predetermined ideas that are probably pretty, you might be wiser than the rest of us, but we all come at this with presupposed ideas, right? Now, some of you, think about your own upbringing now. Before we approach the text here, uh, some of you grew up in really, in, in some extreme patriarchal homes where, where maybe mom just served dad. You know, he was like king. And maybe it was a completely loving relationship. Like totally. I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying that we all have different perspectives here. Some of you, however, have sure enough been hurt and abused uh, in certain ways, emotionally or whatever else, uh, through even through the church or through Christian men. In fact, this week, the Southern Baptist Convention met in Nashville. I follow this a little bit. uh, And some of you may know that among the many issues that they're dealing with is the dealing or or the mishandling even of sexual abuse cases in churches across the convention. And it's not lost on me that it's mostly men, older, sorry, men who are trying to figure this out. And what we want to do is listen. We want to listen. We want to come in close to our women and I want us all to really approach this with a, with a heart that is, is tender. Um, some of you have seen mom and dad in what could be called a complementarian relationship. And it's been beautiful and God-honoring and wonderful. Um, some have seen more of what would be called an egalitarian, kind of more different roles depending on who has you know, certain proclivities or, or gifts. And, and, and that's been a beautiful thing. Um, but you need to know if you're watching us or if you're new here, I talked to new couples, new families this morning, you may not know that our church has been in a long history of raising up women, empowering women uh, to serve Jesus with all they've got. We have women in the highest level of leadership around here in, in, in lay positions. In fact, even currently, our chairwoman of deacons, we have women who are deacons. Our chair right now is Laura Dronzik, and she is amazing, by the way. Anybody that knows her, give me an amen, all right? So our deacons uh, just, you know, are so grateful for her. I asked her to stay on for another year during the pandemic. A lot of our leadership stayed on, stayed the course to bring some kind of normalcy through such a shift over the past year. But she's not the first woman who has been in that role, and she will not be the last. Because God is raising up women. And listen, I want to be clear. We're going to listen to his word. We're going to seek to understand his word, not our culture, because our culture is all kinds of jacked up around Um, sexual, you know, gender issues and all those kind of things. We're not going to be guided by, you know, a misguided patriarchy or misogyny. We're not going to be guided by some secular feminist movement or progressive type, you know, um, cause. That's not our goal either. We're not even going to fall into categories. How about this? That theologians want to put us in. You're either this or you're that. And uh, so now figure out which camp you lie in. Now let the debate begin. 
That's what happens. And yet the gospel, Jesus always provides a third way. You ever notice that? And what we get, we get lost into polarizing positions when there's actually a spectrum depending on the context of scripture and where you are, where you find yourself in real life. So we're going to say there's a third way. So I, I put it this way as we begin with a kind of foundational thought. If your theology doesn't start with love, you need to start over. Because all of this is to push us towards the love of God and the love of all people. And to be clear here, we don't need women to be men. And we don't need men to be women. What I say is we need women at the table in ministry areas or leadership precisely because they're different. Not because we want to be like men. This is the beauty of God's creation. We all bring the image of God to bear Men incomplete without women. And so God has designed us to, to come together. This is why we're saying the paradox today, unity in the age, an age of division. And let me just give you now, before we get there, this grander arc of redemptive history. We look at Genesis 1. We see that we've all been created with equal value in the image of God, male and female, he created them. And then let me ask you this. Who is to rule and reign over all creation? Men and women. And what we see then happening throughout all of Scripture is that God has is, is created us, male and female, in order to proclaim his glory and his image to all people. We go through the Old Testament. If we had time, we would, we would settle in on people like Rahab. We would go to Abigail, who saved the nation, and, and King David from some craziness. Deborah, one of the good judges, by the way, who was in leadership. We see Esther, who saves a nation. I mean, we could walk through all kinds kinds of stories in the Old Testament. We get to the New Testament where Jesus then is going to come on the scene. He's going to release women unlike anyone in all of history. We see Mary at the, Mary, the, well, the mother of Jesus, okay, that's not, not a small thing, brings forth the Savior of the world, but we see Mary, one of his first disciples, who is at the tomb. This is not a small thing. She is the first one to see Jesus risen. She's the first person to see the center of the gospel, which is the resurrection of Jesus. And then it's not a supposed gardener. It's not an angel. It's Jesus who says, go tell my disciples what's happened. You go. She becomes the first evangelist, the first one to proclaim the gospel to anyone. The gospel message that came into your heart and changed your heart at some point, if you have received Christ, came first from Mary to the disciples. To the others. This is not a small thing. Jesus never called women to be silent. He never told women to put on the brakes. He said, go. And so then immediately after the resurrection, you know what happens? We go to, we go to the book of Acts. We walk through the early part of the book of Acts early this year. First, first chapter of the book of Acts. Men and women are praying for the Spirit to come. Acts 2 comes. The Spirit falls. And when the Spirit falls, he falls on men and women, boys and girls, I'm guessing, who are there as well. And they are filled with the Spirit. And when they ask Peter, what is this? He says, this is that. This is what Joel the prophet said would happen. That the spirit of God would fall when the kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven through Christ. Then the spirit, same spirit, Jesus would come upon the people and he says, here's what's going to happen. He's going to fall upon your sons and your daughters. He's going to fall on men and women, on your servants and your maidservants. This is a new thing that God is doing. And he's raising up people now filled with the spirit to go forth to the whole world to proclaim his glory. Jesus sets the stage and the church is born and the kingdom comes and is coming and will come. And so then we look into the epistles and Paul becomes in the primary voice, the primary instructor on how women are to, to act in the church, act in the family. How, where, what are the roles? How does this all play out? He says in Galatians 3, 28, in Christ, he says, now, now there is no Jew, there's no Greek, there's no male, there's no female, there's no slave, there is no free. We're all the same at the foot of the cross. 
And this doesn't mean there's, not, you know, literally, doesn't mean there's not different sexes, right? Different genders. There's male, there's female, but he says we're all the same. There's a lot of opinions about this. I was looking through my research. I came upon a website. It's called The Transformed Wife. It's a popular Christian website for, for women. And in it, it had posted a lot of different teachings that were out there recently. In a recent post, it was entitled this. Listen to this. The recent post said, false female teachers elevate Jesus' words over Paul's. Let that sink in for a minute. Now, a couple things in my mind. I read this and I'm thinking, okay, first of all, if Paul does contradict Jesus, let me ask you, who are you going with? <laughs> who are you going to go with? Right? And then second thing, though, real quick, is like, wait, Scripture didn't contradict Scripture. It's all God's word, right? This is an invitation. Watch this. I told you, this is how you exegete a passage. When you look at something, you go, that doesn't jive with the way of Jesus. That seems to contradict. That's an invitation to go deeper. And almost 100% of the time, it has to do with context. And we're going to see that today. All right? So, lots of teaching, a lot of training here. That's a great principle to follow. And always looking at Scripture through the lens of Jesus because he is perfect theology. And so look at 1 Timothy. Here we go. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, we, we, were, we, we ended with, with verse 8 last, last week for men. And what I want you to see in this passage, if you're taking notes, a good place to start here. I'll, I'll walk through each. I've got three points here. Uh, good works over appearances we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about gifts over positions. And we're going to talk about growth over progress. Jesus offers a third way. Look at verse 9. Likewise, also that men, no, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel. And you, you immediately you wonder, wait, is that like, is this Nordstrom? What, how, how is it respectable? Uh, is this is Target legit? Like, yes, let's go. Um, with, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and, and gold and pearls of costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Now here he's, he's using uh, language that we would describe, you know, character to describe clothing. Did you catch that? See, the women, there's a principle here. And what's happening in, 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 the, in the context, the women of, es, of Ephesus were using the worship service to display the latest fashion. And there's no place for that in the church. There's no place for us to come. Look at costly attire. Again, oh, snap. Some of y'all, like, well, okay. And it's okay to wear nice things and to look good. But these women are flaunting their wealth as member, before members who had less. And he's, again, he's back to, hey, we're all the same here. And, and this is, and look, he's not talking to the top one percentile on the planet, as we see here in North Dallas. What principles can we apply? Women are so pressured to focus on their body, on their looks. Men are too. But to wear the right clothes, to put on the right thing. But in the body of Christ, he says, this is not our focus. Our focus instead, Paul says, I'll tell you what to wear. Adorn yourself with godliness. Focus on that, not on the external. Your worth is not found in your appearance. It's found in your godliness seen in your good works. Key question here. What do I wear then to proclaim that Jesus is Lord of my life? He says, well, you, you wear good works. You, you, you love and, and you honor the Lord in all things. This is for men and women. So it's, it's about good works over appearances. Secondly, look at this. It, it's about gifts over positions. Look at verse 11. Now it gets dicey. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Now here's the deal. If you take one verse and say, Braided hair? Nah, that's something else going on. And then you come to another verse and go, no, but this is legit. Like, let's take this literally, right? Like a lot of you men are like, hey, Jeff, are you going to go to Ephesians 5? Because it says, submit to your husband. Happy Father's Day. Let's go, right? Uh, we're going to get there. But no, too many men do this and we pull out and look at, the, but here's what I want you to see. Learn, learn quietly. He says, the word is hescuchios. It means peaceable. Peaceful is how it's translated in uh, chapter two, verse two. This is interesting. Why isn't it just translated peaceful here instead of quietly? Calm, peaceful. She is to remain peaceable. 
He doesn't use the word siago, which he uses elsewhere, which means silent. No noise. That's not the word. Submissiveness is the word hupotage. It means humble obedience. This is the posture we should all have. You see? And so, so look, this newfound freedom that women had in the early church is combined with this, um, with this worship of the cult goddess uh, Artemis in the Greek, Diana, but Artemis in the Greek. And what they would do, they would offer incantations and prayers out loud, and, and they, would even, uh, they would even adorn themselves. It was kind of the prosperity gospel of their day. Like, I'm going to dress like a goddess, and I, I'm going to come in, and I'm going to just... She was, the, she was also the, the goddess of wealth and prosperity, and even the goddess of, of fertility. It was a very female-centric kind of a worship. The women would even lead out in the worship of it all. And now he says, hey, in this context here, and men coming out of this you know, Jewish into faith in Christ, a lot of the men were leading. And this is an open air kind of thing. Think about, a not, they're not in a great hall. They didn't have a stage. They had, they're just gathering, and people would gather from the outside listening in. And, and, and it was that kind of a context where they would come maybe in a home, but in a, in a gathering like that. And so he's saying, man, we got to have some order. And he's basically saying, women, calm down. Calm down, be quiet, humble disciples, and learn. Now, some say no women should teach or have authority over men. It's what it says. It's for all time. Now, some make a distinction between teaching and exercising authority. Some make a distinction between teaching and preaching. Now, but if you take this literally, and some do, uh, but think through it with me. When does a boy become a man? Churches make distinctions there. Um, is it when he's 13? You know, how do you apply that? Does it go through a bar mitzvah? Do you go back to that? Tag? And then try to apply a principle. Is it at 18? Is it 21? Let's say it's 18. Let's say in our youth group. Okay, so when a boy turns 18, on the, seven, on the day before his, his birthday, you can have a, have a woman teaching him all about Jesus, dropping truth on him. But on his birthday, get, whoa, 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 get out of here. Let's get a man over this guy. I mean, where, where does that fall, Right? So if you're going to play this out, there's all kinds of questions around that. And some have figured that out. Again, I'm not, I'm not going to offer the, the final word here. But, but we, we've got to, to come to grips with the fact that some think and say this is once and for all. Now, if it is, it goes against practice, the practice of, of, of churches that Paul himself have established. In fact, in 1, Tim, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul gives instruction on how women are to prophesy in the gathering. And, and, and one of the clues here is the interpretation of the word that he, he doesn't use the word exousia, which is a common word. Maybe you've heard that word. Power, authority. He uses a different word. And it's found nowhere else in scripture. Makes it challenging. So another exegetical kind of, um, kind of, kind of learning here. It's called a hapax legomenon. There's a word for it. It's a word that's found nowhere else in scripture. You can press your your dad and friends over lunch, the hapax legomenon that we talked about today. Um, and and it's, it's a word, so this is not normal authority. So think about it. What would you do when you look at words in, in Scripture? We go to different places where we find it. Bible Gateway and other, other, other you know, logos and other um, kind of helps. Can, can, you can go to different words and say, oh, it means that over there. Wow, it means that over there. It gives it a greater understanding. What do you do when there's not, the word's not in the Bible anywhere? We well, go to extra biblical material, right? Outside of the Bible, same time period, in the Greek, Koine Greek, what did this word mean? The word is authenteo. The word means self, and it's a compound word, self and armed. You tracking with him here? He's saying these are women who are trying to usurp authority. They're powering up. These are women who are trying to, to arm themselves to take over, if you will, to dominate. And, and Paul says, shut it down. And this is the case for any kind of gathering. And, and yes, women who want to, to, to come forward and say, we're going to take over and it's all about you know, our feminist agenda and progress or whatever else we might call it. And he's saying, no, this is for men and women. Doesn't matter what gender you are. He's saying that, that what, he, what, he, what he's talking about here is the misappropriation of authority. And this can be both men and women. We see the misappropriation of authority among men uh, in, in our day. And we see it among women. Now, Paul is talking about the gathering years, not talking about marriage. Not here. But there are principles to apply. So if we go to Ephesians 5, okay, think about it for just a moment. Ephesians 5, we always look at, I was with a couple this week um, getting married. We're talking about the role of men and women. 
in Ephesians 5, before you get to the passage that we like to pull from, uh, or the verse, women submit to your husbands. Now, it says that clearly. and It says husbands are to be head of the wife, like Jesus is head of the church. The key is, what does he mean by head? Because we've misinterpreted that, misapplied it, misappropriated what it is to be head. Best place to see head is in, is in Philippians 2. Philippians 2, Jesus came from all the way, from the very top, all the way down to give his life for us on the cross. Husbands, that's what you do. Now, is that a powering up? Doesn't seem like it to me. Not in this kingdom. Seems like the father is the first to serve the family. And then if the wife and the husband could get into this, this kind of uh, contest, who's going to outserve each other, you have a happy marriage. And happy kids, by the way. And in Ephesians 5, verse 19, he says, I want everybody to be filled with the Spirit first. Filled with the Spirit. Now, let's go. Verse 21, he says, I want you to submit to one another. Mutual submission in marriage out of reverence for Christ. Mutual submission. He goes on then to talk about how we are to submit to one another. What that looks like. He says, the husband is the head of the the wife just as Christ is the head of of the church. Now, what does this mean? Again, the head is the one, not who's you know, the authoritarian leader. He's the one who's serving and giving his life. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says, he says, okay, women, you submit to your husband, submit your body to your husband because it doesn't belong to you. Then he says, husbands, submit your body to your wife because it doesn't belong to you. Mutual submission in the context of marriage, Jesus offers a third way. We're all about levels, power, and authority. And God says, no, 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 not in my kingdom. Let's all be like Jesus, and this is how this plays out. So we got to continue on here. Let's go to verse 13. It's going to get dicier. Verse 13. For Adam, are you all with me? You still with me? Let's go. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Now the path, this is where it gets difficult. Now it seems to shift where his argument seems transcultural. Now he's going back to creation. This is not contextual. Now what is he talking about here? And some believe that that women should not hold leadership positions uh, because Adam came first and somehow he's superior. Or, no, they'd say, no, it's just order. You need order and function. Okay, I get that too. Some say, no, it's because... They believe that women are more deceived than men, like Eve was deceived. Now, certainly women are not more deceived than men, are they? Men, be careful how you answer that. Some of you guys are getting in trouble over here. Let me ask you this. When you were a kid, did you ever try to pull something over on your mom? How did that go for you? Right? My mom, like she had magical powers. My mom had eyes in the back of her head, right? My mom knew what I was doing miles away. I would be getting in trouble. So it's not the function of of women being more deceived than men. So what is going on here? Why is Eve deceived? Because she's a woman? He says why. Adam came first. God gave Adam the Torah, if you will. He gave him the truth. He's to teach Eve. Here's the deal. She's deceived because she receives the truth indirectly. And yet, when the fall takes place, God comes back and he says, Adam, what have you done? He doesn't come after Eve. Now, they both fell. They both had fallen. Why was she deceived? Because just like these women, he's saying, in the first century, in Ephesus, you don't get the truth uh, indirectly. You need to get it directly. But many of these women are getting the truth indirectly. And and, and we see this in other passages where they had to go home and have their husbands teach them more about it because they didn't have opportunity to receive the truth directly. In fact, in verse 11, Paul says, let a woman learn. Did you catch that? Radical stuff. Let a woman learn. In the church, we need people who are directly hearing from God. Watch this. If you're not in the Word every day, why wouldn't you be in the Word every day? You come here and you're like, well, I hope Jeff's got this down. Man, I hope he's studied this sermon. I hope to learn something. And that's important. It's important to hear from those who are trained and understand these kinds of 
these passages. But if you're in the word, you're only hearing it secondhand, hand me down faith, you will be deceived like the first century women. You will be more easily deceived. This is not a man or woman thing. It happens when you're not in the word and understand the truth directly from God. I'm reminded of Mary in Luke 10, 39. She is, remember where Martha's busy getting after it and then Mary just sitting at the feet of Jesus? She's occupying the space of men. And Jesus says, stay right there. You chose the best thing. You belong right here. You listen to what I'm saying. She's taking it all in. This principle is not gender specific. Even in our day, there are seminaries that have been slow to train up women. So you have fewer women in ministry because we're here indirectly. And I'm here to say, let's all women to be raised up to pursue God's word. What we need are not more conferences about women and how you need to, you know, your self-esteem and you're so fragile and we hope you feel your love and you're blessed. And that's all good. I'm sorry. Um, uh, that wasn't in my notes. What we need are women who are in the word, who are in scripture and growing in knowledge of the word. And yes, teaching others the word of God. So Adam, you see, he comes first and he's responsible for it all. There's a principle there. I think men, lead out in the home. Don't be like Adam. Lead your family in God's word. And look, if women are more easily deceived than than men, why in the world would we have them teach kids who are more deceived and gullible than anybody? And we'd have to shut down VBS, by the way, and a lot of other ministries that are led predominantly by women, you see? And much work in the world, are you aware? Much work that takes place in the world it's taking place through women. The fastest growing church in the world right now is on Iran, mostly led by women. You know why it's not an issue? Who's leading? Who's in power? It's an, this is more, much more of an American, I believe, kind of a corporate model. And instead, why does it not matter out in the world on the mission field? Because the point is to get the gospel out by all means, all people necessary. And God's raising up all of us to share the good news of the gospel. And if you look in scripture, you you just continue on. And and as I noted, this would be contrary to the practice in the churches that Paul has established. We see women, again, in in the book of Acts, are filled with the Holy Spirit. Philip's daughter, daughters are prophesying in Acts 21.9. We see he's given instruction on how to prophesy women in 1 Corinthians 11. In Romans 16, I just want you to look at that passage today. He's dropping names of women. Two-thirds of them are women. And he's talking about leaders who've helped him. We got Junia, who was actually in prison with Paul. Junia was prominent among the apostles. We have Phoebe, who's a deacon there in the church. And we have also Lydia, who's not mentioned in Romans 16, but she's one who opened the door to the gospel in Europe, having the, hosting the, the, the church in her home. We got 10 other women here in Romans 16. You just look at this passage today, and, and I want you to see what God is doing here. Now, if you content, and still, you're like, Jeff, I can't, I don't know. I don't know how far this goes. I still struggle with, the, you know, with women teaching over men or preaching. Uh, I, I get that. I understand. I can argue both sides of this. But here, here's the deal. Currently, you have a male pastor, okay? And anyone who preaches, teaches in our church is going to be assigned by me and with others, vetted by me, if you will. So this is our practice here at least. We see good works over appearances. We see gifts over positions. And then finally, we see growth over progress. And here's what I mean. The progress that will come is when all of us are growing to be like Jesus and we're pushing all of our girls, all of our women towards him to proclaim the gospel. The way we shatter glass ceilings is not primarily through protest, rallying the troops. Instead, it happens when our girls and our women are raised up to be like Christ and released in all of their gifting, listening to him, listening to the spirit of God fall upon them. Now, I'm gonna land on this last verse and it gets even crazier. Look at verse 15. Yet shall, she shall be saved through childbearing. What? If they continue, women continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Now again, scripture interprets scripture. No one is saved through childbearing. What is he saying here? The word is sozo. She will be saved. Um, here's what's happening. I think it's back to the, to the cult of Artemis. I mean, Artemis. He... Uh, he may be referencing the, the impact of, of the goddess Artemis, 
Again, she was known as the, as the goddess of childbearing. And, and so social pressure on women was to remain loyal to the goddess or they could die in childbirth. And remember, there was no epidurals. There are no doctors like we have today. And this is such a beautiful message to women, to young women. He's saying, listen, listen, in the Ephesian context, context you don't have to dress like a goddess. You, you don't have to have babies. You, you, you just commit your life to the grace of Jesus Christ, evidenced by your good works and your love and faithfulness to him. This is such a powerful message. But I also think that what's happening here in the macro narrative, he's saying that even Eve, how about this, is saved. All anyone is saved through childbearing, through childbirth. Ultimately, through the birth of the ultimate baby, Jesus Christ himself. I think what Paul's doing here, he's offering a kind of idiom for femininity and womanhood. And he's saying to all women everywhere, and he's saying it to all of us here in this place, he's saying, listen, you can be saved as a woman. You don't have to be a man. You don't have to be masculine in this context. You don't have to worship Artemis. God accepts women as they are. This is why we're saying growth over progress. Our growth is to continue in faith. Our focus is growth. And so I'd say it like this. Our focus is not breaking glass ceilings. It's not feminism, a sexual revolution. Our focus is growing in faith in what Christ has already done and then allowing his spirit to release us. The focus is on growth, my growth, your growth, the growth of all of us here, the growth of the kingdom. Now, should we try to break glass ceilings? Of course we should. Should women uh, you know, be treated fairly regarding wages and positions and giftings and other matters? Of course that should happen as we advance the kingdom. But listen, when we push our daughters into their giftings and their calling, calling them to, to use their gifts as God has created them, those ceilings are going to be shattered as God releases women across the life of his church. There are no gifts that are given to men that are not given to women. There are no certain things that women can't do because they're women or they're inferior. You can't have real growth or real progress without real growth. And real growth comes as we all commit ourselves fully to him. So I'll close with this. How long? How long will we continue to raise up our girls as little preschoolers to come to know that God loves them? How long will we raise up our elementary age kids to say, you know what, you can understand the gospel, our high school kids, you can come to faith in Christ. How long will we draw our kids, our girls, to come to faith in Jesus and tell them you are fully filled with the spirit of God. God's spirit is upon your life. He has a plan for your life. You can surrender your entire life for him. He loves you, not because you need to be this or that, but because of who you are. How long will we raise up our high school girls and send them off into the future into the world and say you are totally loved by God, filled by the Spirit, gifted by Him. You listen to Him. You follow what He's telling you to do. You obey Him and no one else. How long will we continue to raise up our women to serve the Lord and yet tell them there's certain things you cannot do because of your gender? Not here, friends. Not in the kingdom of God. Jesus has released us to say it's not about positions. It's not about levels. It's about being obedient to him and following him. It is giving our lives over to him. And I just challenge all of us to do that today. Male and female, boys and girls. And I want us to close our time in prayer. Would you just do that? Let's just close our, our eyes and, and bow our heads. A lot of teaching today. A lot of content. So important for us. And Lord, I pray that you would, every person, listen to me, watching online, right here in this room, those in, in the sanctuary, Lord, that you would set us free by the power of your spirit. And Lord, help us to follow your word, obey you in everything that we do. And we'll, we'll let you be the one to determine where you place us, what you call us to do in the context of your church. And so, Lord, release our girls. Release our women to be all that you've called them to be. And we pray that the gospel will advance and the kingdom will come as a result. We give you our lives. In your name we pray. Amen.